Hi everyone, we're going to be carrying on with the energy topic today, looking at energy resources. So we're going to be looking at renewable and non-renewable energy resources, examples of each type, how power stations generate electricity, and the pros and cons of each type. So grab a paper, grab some pens, and follow along with me. Right, let's start by looking at the differences between renewable and non-renewable energy sources. And as always, we're going to start by defining some of the key terms we're going to come across. Renewable energy, which is things like solar power, wind power, and non-renewable energy, things like um, electricity generation using coal, oil, or gas. We're going to start with the renewable side. Now, renewable, let's just define that term. Renewable is any resource that will never run out. And we can usually replace any of the resources before we've used them up. So, for example, if we're using solar power, there's always going to be the sun. We're never going to run out of solar energy in our lifetimes. Now, renewable energy comes in many different forms, and we're going to look at them in a bit more detail later on in the video. But for now, our examples of renewable energy are solar. wind geothermal tidal and wave power biofuel and hydroelectric When we look at non-renewable resources then, this means that they are not going to be renewed, so they are finite. That means that they will run out eventually. And one of the problems with many of the non-renewable resources like coal or oil is they take so long to form. If you didn't know, the oil that we use to make petrol is made from the undecomposed, the sort of not rotted remains of plankton and plants and dinosaurs, other animals from millions of years ago. So you're actually running your car on dead dinosaur juice. There are three main examples of non-renewable energy resources and they all come from fossil fuels. So they are made from the fossilized or undecayed remains of ancient organisms. So you have your main three, coal, oil, and natural gas. Natural gas has nothing to do with farts. It's just the gas that gets released whilst things are decaying. So often you'll get a, a oil deposit where you know those rich people go, yeehaw, I've struck oil and struck gold because gold is worth a lot of money. So you have that oil layer and then above the oil layer you have like a little chamber of gas and it's that gas that can get siphoned off when they're drilling for oil as well and is used to heat our homes and provide sort of fuel for all sorts of things. Our energy resources are mainly used in heating, generating electricity and in transport. So let's have a look at a few examples now. We're going to start with looking at transport. So for example, if we're looking at renewable energy, there aren't that many options currently. I mean, there are more electric cars being built than ever before, thanks to the you know, work of Tesla and other companies. But you can actually generate something called biofuel, as we mentioned here. Biofuel is just made from plant material and uh, animal poo, animal dung. And when that is uh, rotted, it releases a lot of gas and that gas can be used in powering cars and, or mixed with diesel, etc., to make fuel. You can also use biofuel to heat homes, but we'll look at that in a second. Most of our energy resources that are used for heating are non-renewable. Now crude oil, that big gloopy fat, thick black stuff that you see um, is broken down by a process called cracking to make lots of different fuels. So oil itself, which is our non-renewable resource, can be used to make petrol and diesel and those can be used to power our cars. Energy resources can also be used for heating our homes. And again, we can use a mixture of non-renewable and renewable resources to do this. For heating on the renewable side, we have things like biofuels, which as well as being used for transport can be used for um, heating our homes. 
You can also use from the renewable side geothermal energy, which we'll look at in a minute, but that is just using the heat from rocks underneath the Earth's surface, sort of nearer to that magma layer that is used to uh, either heat homes directly or is used to uh, heat water, which is used to drive turbines to generate electricity. Another more renewable energy resource you can use for heating is solar heaters. And on the non-renewable side for heating, you can use uh, lots of fossil fuels. So you can have gas boilers that heat your home, or you can have oil burners as well, oil radiators. So that's, in a nutshell, our main overview of our renewable resources, our non-renewable resources, and how each type of resource can be used generally. What we're going to look at now is how non-renewable energy can generate electricity in a bit more detail. So I'd grab a new bit of paper and make this diagram nice and big. Right, let's have a look at thermal power stations. Before we delve in though, let's again break up our key terms. So power stations are places that generate electricity. And I'm sure by now you can associate the term thermal with heat. So it's generating electricity using heat. There are a number of ways that you can generate the heat needed to do this sort of electricity generation. You have non-renewable resources such as coal or gas. Now oil could be used here or rather the um, fuels made from oil but oil itself has far more uses. Lots of oils used to make plastics so many people that are only oil or buy oil, don't buy it for using as a fuel, it's far more useful to use in industry to make plastics. So that's why coal and gas stations are by far the most common. You can actually use geothermal energy to heat water and generate electricity this way as well. And also more than ever before, biofuel is being used in to replace regular fuels. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with the electricity that's generated for your homes, you're using it right now to watch me on YouTube, but have you ever stopped to think about where does that energy come from? How does it get from the big power station that you might see driving around to powering your phone or powering your PlayStation? So we're going to go through the process step by step. I'm going to explain each step and then I get you to copy it down and then at the end I'll go for the whole process. Remember this is going to link back to our energy stores and energy transfers so if you aren't familiar with that I would maybe go back and watch the previous video I'll link it in the description or put a little box up here if I can work out how to do that YouTube's good but just take your time and follow along with me and sorry about my dog. Okay we're going to start with our furnace this is where your fuel, so your biofuel or your coal or your gas is burned to generate lots of heat. That heat is used to heat up water that are put in pipes that go through the furnace to generate steam. So we've got a transfer of heat, a heat store that transfers via heating into the thermal store in the water and then that will cause the water to evaporate or boil into steam. The next stop of this steam is into a very large turbine. Turbine is just like a very large fan. It spins rapidly as the steam is forced through. Think of like um, getting one of those old pinwheel uh, windmills that you used to get when you were little and phew, you blow them and they spin round so it's the same idea. The steam is mechanically transferring energy into the kinetic store inside that turbine. What happens then is that spinning turbine spins a core of metal inside a magnet which generates electricity. We'll look at how electromagnets and electromagnetic generation works in a future topic but for now the turbine spins and that spins the generator 
and that causes an electrical transfer of energy and that will go to a battery for storage or it will go directly to the uh, power lines to your house. What happens next is then, as I said, that energy, that electricity is transferred electrically through wires and it's either stored for later use or it's sent directly to your home. Now, the electricity that's generated by a power station is far too high to power anything in your house. If you try to uh, plug a phone charger for example or your phone directly into the power coming out of a power station it would explode so often you have things called transformers which bring the charge down or bring bring the voltage down so it's not going to damage anything now we're nearly done we just need to talk about what happens to this excess steam so the steam that drives the turbine is going to cool eventually and when it cools it will condense back into water That steam and water gets collected and it runs through into very large cooling towers. I expect you've probably seen these cooling towers before and thought, oh, that's a nuclear power plant. But no, the cooling towers are those big structures that look a bit like a giant chimney. And often they have big billowing clouds coming out of them if it's the right time of day. These aren't nuclear power plants. These are actually cooling towers. So this takes that steam coming out of the turbine and makes sure everything condenses back into water and that water can be used and recycled again. And that is how electricity is generated. As all good scientists do, we need to link back our previous knowledge on energy stores and energy transfers to this idea of a power station generating electricity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a series of boxes for all the stores and a series of squiggly arrows for all the transfers and then we'll talk through them one by one. Okay, the first energy store we have is the chemical energy store inside those fuels. So your coal, your oil, sorry, your coal, your gas, or your biofuel. That chemical energy store is depleted, it's emptied as that energy is transferred through heating into the thermal store in the water that's getting warmed up. That thermal store of energy is transferred mechanically as the water moves through the pipes and spins the turbine and that kinetic energy store inside the turbine will start to get bigger. As that turbine spins, it's also spinning that generator so the energy is going to be transferred mechanically from the kinetic store in the turbine into the kinetic store inside the generator. Now we've got the generator generating electricity, so that is going to be transferred electrically either to your house via a transformer or into storage inside large batteries. If you have the battery, that's going to be a chemical store and if we have the appliances in your house, they're going to be a mixture of either the electricity is going to be um, transferred into whatever device it is and uh, the store will be different depending on what the device is. So going through it one more time, we've got a chemical store inside of the fuels that's transferred by a heating to the thermal store inside the water. The water is heated and turns into steam and that transfers energy mechanically as it's spinning, so it's moving through the pipes and spinning the turbine. That fills up the turbine's kinetic store so it can move and spin. When it spins, that's going to mechanically transfer energy into the generator. The generator is going to spin and generate electricity and that's going to be electrically transferred either into a chemical store of a battery or directly into your home via a transformer into the various stores of all your appliances there. That's it for part one where we've covered the different types of energy resources, so a renewable overview, a overview of non-renewable. We've looked at how thermal energy is 
generated in a power plant and we've looked at the stores and transfers within. In the next part of this topic, what we're going to be looking at in a bit more detail is all of those renewable energy resources, looking at their pros and their cons and how they work and all of those beautiful stores and transfers. So make sure you check in for that part and I will see you next time.